Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon for a talk in the Bletchley Park Carroll College Week. Um, in helping to put the week together, I was very keen for a Second World War focus and also for a focus that looked after Oxford, which talks later in the week will do, and that looked more generally at universities and the role of universities in the Second World War with an intelligence link, although not necessarily specifically to Bletchley. But I also wanted to be anchored very much with a, with, with a Bletchley theme. And so therefore I approached David Kenyon, who is the resident historian of Bletchley, and he was kind enough to agree to come and talk to us. Um, he's going to talk on graduate recruitment practices and the government code in Cyprus school before the war and during the war. David's responsible for all public content and historical material that is generated and used by Bletchley Park as an institution. And he's also a widely published author, and a lot of his books and his work, um, be that from his sort of former archaeological days or his days as a, as a historian, has been used um, for television programmes and other forms of sort of consult consultancy and media uh, output. His recent book, a Yale book, called Bletchley Park and D-Day um, is his latest work and a, and a fine book, those of you who have seen it will know. But he's also worked on things like First World War Trenches that has led to involvements with things like Trench Detective series on television and indeed his interest in the cavalry, in military horses and related things not only led to a book, Horsemen in No Man's Land, but it also led to consultancy and involvement with the, the famous film, uh, War Horse, but also things like War Horse, The True Story, which was a Channel 4 series some time ago. Um, but I think it's particularly in David's role as, uh, if you like, the official historian attached to Bletchley, um, that he comes to us today to talk to us about the role of graduates and university recruits in the Second World War and intelligence generally before that as well. Very pleased to welcome you, David. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ashley, for that uh, introduction. You covered um, some of the ground I was going to cover myself. Uh, yes, um, I am the research historian at Bletchley Park. Uh, there was just one of me for a while. There is now two of us. I have a, 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 an assistant historian. Um, and our role is to support all of the content that Bletchley Park produces, uh, be it in exhibitions or online or in talks or whatever else, with facts. And part of the problem of the story of Bletchley Park is that, well, firstly, it was secret until the 1970s, but then the relevant documentation has taken a number of years to be declassified uh, the most recent release, for example, was actually 2018. So material has come out in dribbles and drabs for a long time. The result of that is there is a, a large uh, body of mythology, if you like, that has built up around Bletchley and its story. And my job is, as I sometimes put it, to be, to be the grumpy ministry of truth, to tell people that the exciting stories they've heard are not necessarily true and they have to tell a different one. Uh, I would uh, often, uh, I would hope an equally exciting one, but uh, so yeah, so they, 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 they pay me a wage to read books about World War II all day, which is rather wonderful. Um, one of those mythologies is around uh, how people got involved with uh, the Government Code and Cipher School, uh, which was the institution that moved to Bletchley Park, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and there are various stories about crossword puzzles and other things, which... Uh, we can talk about later if you like, but I'm not going to talk about them because they're a bit of a waste of time because they don't have much foundation in evidence. But what I am going to talk about is how people from the universities and people from Oxford and Cambridge in particular ended up in the Government Code and Cipher School. And as I say, this is a piece of work I did a few years ago, but it hadn't gone anywhere for a while. 
And when Ashley got in touch, and we'd previously been talking about his work on Oxford during the war because we were talking about the code making activity at Mansfield College. And I thought, well, what can I talk about which is related to Oxford and Cambridge and Bletchley Park? And I thought, well, I've done all this work. I'll, it's a great chance to get this out in the air. So, so that's what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about tonight. Uh, for the benefit of those of you who aren't as intimately familiar with the Government Code and Cipher School as I am, uh, there is a misconception among a lot of our visitors, in particular, that Bletchley Park is, is a wartime phenomenon, if you like. Uh, it isn't. Uh, the Government Code and Cipher School actually starts its life uh, here uh, in the Admiralty in 1919, when they took uh, the Army Code Breaking Operation MI1B and NID25, which is better known as Room 40, because that was the room it was in the Admiralty, which is a naval code breaking operation. And those two operations were civilianized uh, in 1919 and set to work in peacetime as the Government Code and Cipher School, which wasn't a school, it didn't teach anyone anything. It was a, a signals intelligence agency. Uh, and it was managed by, um, initially by the Navy, but then from 1922 by the, by the Foreign Office. And in particular, it became a, under the umbrella of the Secret Intelligence Service, MI6. And so from, from the 20s until 1938, it's here at uh, 55 Broadway, which was the, the, the London home of SIS. And uh, was a quite a small organization. I'll talk a little bit more about its pre-war character as we move forward. It was based in there, and that was that. But in 19, uh, the late 1936, 1937, there is this increasing perception that a world war is coming, and when it comes, it will be an air war, and cities, including London, will be very heavily bombed in the first moments of the war. So the government came up with a number of evacuation plans for all of the organs of government. Uh, SIS is no exception, and GCNCS is no exception, and Bletchley Park was acquired Bletchley Park down here. This photograph was taken in 1938. Uh, it was acquired by Hugh Sinclair, who was then C, uh, as home for his code breakers. So they moved to Bletchley in 1938. They stay there, do all the famous things they do in World War II. Then the organisation shrinks again in 1946. And in 1954, uh, heads west to Cheltenham and is now comfortably housed, well, not terribly comfortably, it's busy outgrowing the donut in um, Cheltenham. Interestingly, the organisation now has a staff of something like 12,000, so it's, it's getting a little bit bigger than it was in World War II. Um, I won't go into what people's opinions of that might be, but um, the point about this is the Government Code and Cipher School and GCHQ are the same thing. The organisation is 103 years old. It celebrated its centenary in 2019, with a nice exhibition at the Science Museum that some of you may have gone to, and uh, they gave me a badge, which was nice. Um, so I'm going to talk about this bit and this bit, if you like. Um, the areas I want to talk about are how people found their way into the Government Code and Cipher School in the 20s and 30s, uh, because there was a very formal process for getting people in, and then, and that shapes the character of the organisation in many ways. And, uh, and that process and how that process comes about means that the Government Code and Cipher School has a very particular character in the 1930s. In the immediate build up to the war, there is a process of creation of the emergency lists. Uh, and this is where a number of the very famous code breakers like Alan Turing and Gordon Welshman were recruited. Um, and there's a sort of uh, moment of emergency recruiting at that period and then subsequent to that uh, from 1940 onwards as the organization grows you have a again a, a third different method of recruitment so how people get into the organization changes over time and reflects the changing character of the organization but there are certain themes that um, run through that process which, which recur, and um, spoiler alert, it's no coincidence I'm talking about this at Oxford. <laughs> the man who's responsible for most of this is uh, 
Alistair Denniston. Uh, he was, uh, well, first of all, codebreaker, uh, paymaster commander in the Royal Navy. And he was appointed head of GCNCS in 1919. He remained running the organization until 1942. So GCNCS, Bletchley Park, is Denniston's baby in many ways. He didn't get to run it till the end of the war. He was moved on in 1942. But much of its character is a result of um, Denniston. Uh, he had very particular preferences, if you like, for for recruiting people, and he he cast the net um, in a very shallow way, if you like. And we'll we'll in investigate some of what he thought about that as we go forward. A point to remember during this process is that GCNCS pre-war is a very small organisation. It has probably 30 people who we would consider code breakers and in inverted commas what they would nowadays call crippies cryptanalysts people who are actually doing coal face mathematical and linguistic code breaking it has a staff of about 100 altogether but that includes uh its uh support staff and um uh non-code breaking analytical personnel and things like that so it's a very small outfit this means that it doesn't need to recruit very many people very often it's a real kind of dead man's shoes organization. Um, the other point is it doesn't publicly advertise its recruitment in the same way that uh, none of the intelligence services did until about a decade ago. Uh, you couldn't apply to join GCNCS. GCNCS applied to you for you to join. Uh, they had to choose you, not vice versa. And so that's a, that's a factor in how the process works. However, at the same time, GCNCS was part of the Foreign Office, and the Foreign Office worked through the Civil Service Commission, who were, I believe still are, the recruitment organisation for the Civil Service, and so there was a formal structure of admission into GCNCS. It wasn't as simple as somebody coming up to you over uh, dinner at high table and going, oh, I've got a job for you, old man. Uh, they actually had to um, try a bit harder than that. Uh, so, and interestingly, we have... Uh, a lot of correspondence on file. Alistair Denniston wrote a, his own report in 1944 of the pre-war organisation and uh, a substantial quantity of his correspondence from the 1920s and 30s survives in the National Archives. So you can, you can read about a lot of this in his own words and we'll see some of that as I go through. Um, it's, uh, some of it makes uh, slightly embarrassing reading on his part, as we will see. Uh, to go back to 1927... There is correspondence between Denniston and a man called Mayer, who was at the Civil Service Commission, and it describes the process of recruitment. And they, uh, Denniston uh, offered Mayer a list of the universities that they would consider recruits from. They were, they were clearly looking for graduates. You had to have a degree to come in. Uh, but these were the universities that they thought uh, might be suitable. Uh, interestingly, uh, there's very relatively little evidence that they ever cast the net this wide. Um, the, I think if you crossed out everything except the top line, you'd be doing quite well. And uh, Mayor actually wrote back saying that, um, that uh, Dublin um, was, uh, wasn't a British university. It was in one of the dominions, so it probably didn't count, um, which uh, kind of sets the tone for the debate as we go forward. Um, and uh, in the same paperwork where this, this list is presented, um, that's in 1927. In 1932, we have a letter from Denniston uh, describing what he thinks should happen because they've got some vacancies in GCNCS. Uh, he says uh, explicitly that they should only approach Oxford and Cambridge. He says, none of these other... Whoops, pressing too many buttons. Uh, we don't need any of these other universities. The people we need are probably at Oxford and Cambridge, so that will be fine. And each university had what in those days were, what is now the careers service in those days was the University Appointments Board. And so you would go to your university's appointments board and they would find your job. And he said, uh, these boards have supplied us with very suitable recruits. And in order to limit publicity as far as possible, I would have prefer not to inform the other appointments boards for the present. 
to see whether Oxford and Cambridge could produce a number of suitable candidates. Um, and the result of this is that although there is a competitive exam, only people from Oxford and Cambridge and only people who've been selected at Oxford and Cambridge, largely without their knowledge, are invited to take the exam. Uh, what would happen is uh, they would take a number of exams. What's rather wonderful is the exam papers themselves survive in the uh, National Archives and you can see exactly what questions were asked of these uh, applicants. Uh, there were a total of 13 potential exams you could sit. Uh, there were two in English, one in arithmetic and two each in French, German, Italian, Russian and Spanish. And each candidate was expected to sit the two English papers, the arithmetic paper, and two papers each in two, of other, two other languages. So quite a high bar for um, each candidate's skill set. Uh, there's, a, there's a maximum mark of 700. Each paper is marked out of 100. And you had to get at least 420 or 60% in order to be considered. Um, this is the English paper. Um, I appreciate some of you won't be able to read it from the back. But... I think this is quite instructive of the kinds of people they were looking for and the backgrounds of the kinds of people they expected to recruit because this is a very upper middle class exam. Uh, for example, uh, the questions, to what extent can you judge a man's character and capacity by his appearance? Question two, which I particularly love, the arguments for and against state support for a national opera house or theatre. Which, you know, yes, um, I, I'm not sure how many, um, which, how, how wide a sector of our current um, educate, uh, undergraduates would be able to answer that question. Uh, yes, point out some disadvantages of our present calendar and discuss suggestions for its reform. Or select any two writers of short stories and compare their merits. So you see, it's, um, it's quite uh, highbrow, as I say, upper, upper middle class stuff. Uh, if you pass these exams sufficiently well, uh, you would then face uh, an interview a civil service commission interview panel, which included, in most cases, Deniston himself. He would sit on the interviews and choose people. Uh, we also know how some people did, uh, because the exam results are also in the file, which is, again, rather wonderful. Uh, two of the competitions in 1925 and 1927, uh, we see recruitment of candidates who go on to be very significant figures in GCNCS in World War II. So we see where they start out. Uh, this chap on the um, left here, uh, Josh Cooper, uh, he took the exam in 1925. He got 532, which is 76% in the exams, which was the second highest applicant that year. Um, and uh, he, he did French and Russian as his two, two, two languages. Uh, by 1936, he is the head of air section at Bletchley Park, and he goes on to run air section um, through the war and becomes actually deputy director of GCNCS in 1944. So um, very successful um, code breaker and manager of other code breakers. Uh, he, he had a reputation, actually, for um, he, he would um, put his arms behind his head and round his back when he was talking to people because he had a sort of tick. And he would, people would deliberately try and engage him in conversation until his arms were completely entangled behind him. And then they'd ask him the time, <laughs> see how, how, how quickly he could get his watch back out. Um, but yes, there's a, there's a rather wonderful cartoon of him in our archive of this figure with kind of long snake arms that connect in all sorts of directions. Uh, the other chap is, is uh, Wilfred Bodsworth. Uh, he passed in 1927. He only got 65%. Uh, he did French and Spanish. And he went on to be uh, head of German naval section at Bletchley Park, so a very important uh, role dealing with uh, Naval Enigma. Now, this photograph was actually taken when he became part of the uh, GCHQ liaison team who travelled to Washington, D.C. Uh, in 1944. And that, that work is very important because it leads into the uh, Yukusa Agreement in 1946 and what we now know as Five Eyes, so the, the whole intelligence relationship with the United States. So he's a very important man. Um, there is one woman in the list that I've been able to identify, a lady called Sylvia Nairn, who passed the exam in 1925, but there is no record of her name anywhere else during the war, so it would appear that she was not recruited, even though she passed the exam. And we'll come back to Denniston's opinions on that a little bit. Uh, in 1932, 
they stopped the exams, but they carried on with interviews and they would base people's linguistic ability on uh, school qualifications, university qualifications. So they would basically say if you had a degree in French and German, you, that, that was considered to be enough. But that's not the only hurdle you have to get over. There is also from uh, 1922, 1932, the regulations for the recruitment by competitive selection of candidates for situations as junior assistants in the government code and cipher school. So if you can pronounce all that, that's the first hurdle you've got over. Um, this is the, the detailed regulations and these are tight. A regulation one, as it says there, you have to be between the ages of 21 and 25 on, a, on the year of application. And more importantly, paragraph two, candidates must be natural born British subjects or born within the United Kingdom or in one of its self-governing dominions of parents also born within these territories. So you have to be thoroughly British. Uh, the self-governing dominions, of course, is a, is a euphemism for what were also referred to as the white dominions, um, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada. So, and both your parents are expected to be British. So essentially, you have to be white to get in. There is a colour bar at GCNCS. Uh, we try, we, we, we're figuring out how we re represent that in our exhibitions, but sadly, it is a fact of the 1940s or 1930s in this case. Uh, and interestingly, it's always struck me as interesting, although I know f I've not found strong research evidence about this, that uh, Indian nationals, uh, whether um, of European origin or not, uh, were not permitted to join. And given the strength of Indian mathematics at both Oxford and Cambridge in the 1930s, you'd think there would be a, a healthy pool of potential code breakers there but uh, they, are, they are not recruited for whatever reason. Uh, even though uh, Indians within India became involved in the organisation later in the war, but that's, a, that's another talk I will give you on another day. Just how strict the regulations were is shown by uh, some candidates who didn't get in. There's a chap called Hunter who was exclude, excluded in 1932 on the basis that he was not 21 years old on the 1st of January of the year despite being 21 when he sat the interview. Uh, another chap was excluded on the grounds that he turned 25 before the end of 1937. Again, he was 25 when he had the interview, but uh, his birthday came too soon. Another chap uh, called Hampson was excluded when he, they discovered that his father, although white and naturalized British, was actually originally Armenian. So he was excluded. So it's, they really restrict who they can get in on the basis of these nationality criteria. Later in the war, they realised that if you want to recruit a lot of people that, speaking, that speak German, maybe actually employing a few Germans would be a good idea. And the, these restrictions are massively relaxed, but that doesn't take place till around 1941, 1942, in the early period. Uh, female candidates are explicitly included, but they must be unmarried or widows and will be required to resign their appointments on marriage which was the standard Foreign Office uh, doctrine of the time. Married women could not work for the Foreign Office. Um, and Deniston uh, wasn't keen on female recruits. He, he, he knew he had to accept female recruits, but he wasn't a fan. And several times this occurs in the literature. Uh, he wrote to Mayor, the guy from the Civil Service Commission in 1932, and uh, he observed, the duties require that a man should be appointed on this occasion, so there is no point in forming the women's colleges. Here we go. This paragraph here. Uh, Mayor wrote back and went, well, that might be a bit awkward, we need an excuse. And he said, the most, di the most difficult point is the exclusion of women, since the regulations contemplate their admission. In what way do the duties require that a man should be appointed on this occasion? If the Foreign Office is challenged on this exclusion, perhaps the best defence would, would be the inadvisability of too wide notification of the existence of the Code and Cipher School. So telling men's colleges that we have a code-breaking organisation is OK, but telling women's colleges that we have a code-breaking organisation is not OK, because clearly they can't keep a secret. Um, latterly, uh, as late as 1938, uh, Deniston is faced with a problem that he has two 
senior vacancies and one of them has already been earned on seniority by an existing female member of staff. And uh, he wrote on that occasion, I did not get in touch with any of the ladies' colleges because there is one very strong candidate, a Miss Egan, who has actually worked here for three years and will receive the strong backing of the heads of the sections in which she has worked. And I could not face the prospect of having our vacancies filled 100% by women. There were only two jobs going and Miss Egan was going to get one of them, so the other one had to be a man. So um, there is, as well as a colour bar, something of a gender bar as well. Uh, I, I rather flippantly describe this to people as uh, Bletchley Park recruiting in the 1930s was incredibly diverse. They took uh, privately educated middle class white men from both Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, and that, that may be a joke, but it, 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 a, a profound truth lies within it. So the organisation prior to 1938 is not a diverse recruiter of great minds regardless of where they come from. It is part of the Foreign Office and it works in the same prejudiced Victorian way that the Foreign Office has worked for some time. Where, has it changed? You be the judge. Um, anyway, to move on to the emergency lists. In 1937, it's clear Denison needs to basically double the size of his organisation. So how does he go about this? Uh, he's, he's given funding. Uh, Through the clerk's department, we obtain treasury sanction for 56 seniors, men or women, with the right background and training, salary £600 a year, and 30 girls with a graduate knowledge of at least two languages on £3 a week, which is not £600 a year. It's £150 a year. Um, and a list is compiled of all of these people. And you can see here, um, this is a description of of the lists being compiled. Basically, they went out through, there were a number of First World War code breakers who, who'd returned to Oxford, Cambridge, and were active in the academic community, and they were able to, to headhunt students, other members of staff, individuals who they thought would be suitable code breakers, and make the right subtle introductions. And uh, these people were then um, called in for uh, training. The phrase that Denison used was, uh, as it says here, men of the professor type, which is what he was looking for. And he went on, to obtain such men and women, I got in touch with all the universities, well, both the universities, we should perhaps say. It was natural at the time, naturally at the time impossible to give details of the work, nor was it always advisable to insist too much in these circles on the imminence of the war. At certain universities, however, there were men now in senior positions who had worked in our ranks during 14 to 18. These men knew the type required, thus it fell out that our most successful recruiting occurred from these universities. During 1937 and 1938, we were able to arrange a series of courses to which our in we invited our recruits to give them even a dim idea of what would be required of them. This enabled our recruits to know the type of man and mind best fitted, and they in turn would could and did earmark, if only mentally, further suitable candidates. These men joined up in September 1939. Um, and uh, I'd say a lot of reference to men, a lot of reference to all the universities, meaning both the universities. Uh, Denison himself wasn't an Oxbridge graduate. He'd actually been educated in Bonn, University of Bonn and at the Sorbonne. But uh, the certain universities he was talking about were certainly Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, and some of those recruiters that we, we heard about are People like uh, Dilwyn Knox, for example, who had worked in Room 40, he'd been involved with the Zimmerman Telegram. Uh, he went back to King's Cambridge during the war, during the interwar period, uh, although he continued to work part-time for GCNCS. And then he came back to, to break Enigma in 1940. Again, Frank Adcock, who was an ancient historian at Cambridge, was uh, a prolific recruiter of classicists. And it was the, the, the social networks of these people that allowed them to... Um, find the candidates. We have the lists of people who joined. We also have lists of people who were in the organisation later on. And there's a list from 1941, which gives you quite a good sense of who had, who had stuck around, if you like. And what's, what I can do, because we also have our, we have what we call our role of honour. There is no one um, complete list, staff list of Bletchley Park. There are many, many lists in many, many different places which list partial portions of the staffing at different times. 
So a few years ago, an exercise was done which pulled all that information together into a single database. And we now have an online role of honor on our website, which lists everybody we know who worked at Bletchley Park. Uh, that list continues to grow. People find stuff in their attic from their granny, and it turns out their granny was a code breaker. So we are adding people all the time. We're now on about 13 and a half thousand names. So it's, it's a huge number of people. But what you can do, although some of those people, there's just the name and we know nothing about them. Other people, we've interviewed them. If they've survived, we have a full biography, all sorts. So it's, a, it's quite a partial data set, but it is possible to search that data set and pull out uh, a limited amount of information about people's educational background. And that's what I've done. So, uh, yes, um, where are we? Uh, I'll get back to these ladies. Let's go back there. Uh, I looked at that list and there are 91 men and seven women on the 1941 list in what are called assistant officer grades, which are temporary senior assistant officers and temporary junior assistant officers who these are the senior code breaking pre-war kind of clever guys and ladies i cross-referenced these with the names of on the roll of honor and i was able to identify the the degree awarding institution for 55 out of those 98 people of those 55 35 went to cambridge and 17 went to oxford so 52 out of 55 were Oxbridge educated. Um, so in 95% of the cases where I could identify the affiliation, it was Oxbridge. Uh, the only other two who are on the list are University of London. And in particular, one of them is uh, Bedford College, which of course was one of the few institutions in pre-war Britain that was awarding degrees to women, because of course Oxford and Cambridge were, you could graduate, you, well, you could complete the courses, but you weren't given a degree formally. Uh, my granny went to Cambridge in 1937. She didn't get a degree until the 1980s. Um, so, uh, oh, and there's only one other person who is Nigel de Grey, who was a pre-war code breaker, but had gone to Dartmouth Royal Naval College as a naval officer, and so had never been to university. Um, this may seem shocking, but at the same time, you have to remember that in 1939, 85% of the civil service went to Oxford and Cambridge. So Bletchley Park is not unusual and the Foreign Office is not, is not unusual in terms of government departments. The function of Oxford and Cambridge was to produce people who would then go on to work in the government, uh, either as politicians or as civil servants. And so the fact that this is where they all come from is, it doesn't make Bletchley Park unusual. It makes Bletchley Park plumb and centre typical of a government agency of the time. What about the women? Well, uh, it's much more difficult to identify uh, the university affiliations of women because in that early period, pre-war period, there were very few women employed in the first place and we know relatively little information about them. Uh, the 1941 list, we can only identify the university background of three ladies. Two of them are quite famous. This is uh, Joan Clark on the left and that's Margaret Rock on the right. Uh, Margaret Rock went to Bedford College London back in the early 1920s. She was in her 40s by the time she came to Bletchley. And uh, Joan Clark went to uh, Cambridge. There was a third lady, Vera Bostock, who we don't have a picture of, unfortunately, who came here to Oxford. This is a very, it's a meaningless sample, three people out of 13,000. But uh, it shows that even the, the few women that they did recruit were still from Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, the only other, um, and in fact, there's a lady at the Foreign Office called called Mrs. Moore or Miss Moore, who throughout the war her name crops up over and over again because she is a principal uh, recruiter for the Foreign Office, and she knows all of the university appointments boards and she has fingers in pies all over the country, and a huge number of the women who make their way into GCNCS pass through the hands of uh, Miss Moore. She was actually helped by uh, Rachel Strachey who was the wife of Oliver Strachey, who worked at Bletchley Park and part of the same family as Lytton Strachey, the, the biographer. Uh, and uh, Ray Strachey was secretary of the Women's Employment Federation, which was the kind of umbrella body for women's university appointments boards. Uh, and we know that uh, Ray Strachey produced a list of 15 women all at Manchester University, who she considered uh, suitable for work at Bletchley Park. 
None of them occur in our role of honour. As far as I can tell, none of them got a job. So they found all these people, uh, all these men, I should say, uh, and they need to train them. So uh, training courses were run in the, uh, in the early part of 1939. And again, in the archives, we have lists of who was trained and what they were trained in. And uh, not everybody who did the training ended up at Bletchley Park. A number of people, uh, for whatever reason, never made it to um, GCNCS. You'll see on this list down the bottom here, there's a certain gentleman who I believe went off and spent World War II writing a book instead of breaking codes. Um, he has Keen written after his name. And the former GCHQ historian, Tony Comer, uh, asserts that that represents his enthusiasm to come to Bletchley. I disagree. I think it's a note on how to pronounce his name. But we don't know. Uh, so not all of the candidates made it. And again, not all candidates, when push came to shove in 1939, were suitable. Uh, one man who proved unsuitable to be recruited is an unfortunate chap called DC McGregor from uh, Balliol College. And the reason DC McGregor didn't make it is down the bottom of the list here. He was initially marked as sick and then subsequently marked as dead. So you can't be a code breaker if you're dead, apparently. Um, so that's, that's the emergency process. And you can see, although it's an emergency process, it's a process to get more quickly exactly the same people as you were getting slowly before. So actually nothing has changed in terms of the, the character of the organisation and the kind of people they want in it. And this is Deniston's GCHQ. He ran an organisation that relied on Oxford and Cambridge for its personnel and was managed as if it were a quasi Oxbridge College. The relationships people had with one another and the way they worked was very collegiate and academic and a lot of them continued to work part time in their universities and it was all very comfortable if you like. The problem is although on the 4th of September 1939 there are 186 of these people. I say the 4th of September because they're civil servants. The war began on the 3rd of September, but that's a Sunday and no one was at work. So they came to work on Monday morning, which was the 4th. Um, but there are 186 of them. By 14th of January 1945, there are 8,995 of them. So the organisation has grown in personnel about 50-fold in five years. It expands massively and the character of the organisation completely changes. And it goes from a largely university educated um, elite organisation to an organisation where those people are in the higher management echelons of the organisation and underneath them are a huge number of, of workers, factory workers essentially, who are doing the the day-to-day -day code breaking. What they do, which is one of the fundamental reasons for Bletchley Park's success, is they take processes that might have been developed by Bill Tartar, Alan Turing or whoever, which are highly mathematical, highly technical, and they take them and they, they, they break them down into a production line of processes that people with a secondary educa school education can achieve. And what you end up with is production lines for intelligence, where you feed data in at one end, it goes through six or eight offices of different people, none of whom really understand what they're doing, um, and they do little processes and it works its way through and it pops out the other end as either a decrypt or a piece of intelligence or whatever else you need. So uh, the, the character of the workforce and the, the level of education of the workforce changes markedly as the war goes on. Uh, I dug into the, uh, the role of honour again. We have this, this um, over 13,000 names. There were, there were about 11,000 names when I did this research because it was a few years ago, but we, the, the data is probably still stands up. Very few of them can be traced to a specific university. Um, not all of them we know anything about, and even the ones we know something about, they haven't necessarily told us where they've got their degree. So a total of 395 staff can be linked to a particular university on our Roll of Honour. Um, some of these worked at the Y stations, which are the intercept sites rather than Bletchley Park itself. Uh, some of them were Americans, so that reduces the number. But we do get to a final list. Oh yes, that's, that's some, some of the more junior people at Bletchley Park doing code breaky stuff. This is the chart we're talking about. This is our 361 people and it may be a bit small to read from the back but 
The top two lines there are Oxford and Cambridge. Oxford, 67 men, 26 women, 93 total. Cambridge, 124 men, 29 women, 153 total. So 246 out of 361 are Oxbridge. Uh, London University, all the college, various bits of London University, including Bedford College significantly, provide another 37. And all of the other universities in the country combined provide 21. Uh, in England, that is. So uh, the massive bias in favour of Oxford, Cambridge and the University of London. Uh, Scotland does quite well. There's 42 candidates from Scottish universities. Uh, this is partly Miss Moore's work. Miss Moore at the Foreign Office had a view that uh, women from the Scottish universities were um, the right kind of people for Bletchley Park. Somehow there was some, she had this mental image of these sort of I don't know, slightly fusty Presbyterian ladies who would be very reliable and loyal and modest. And so she, she would actually do tours of the Scottish universities and select women and bring them back. So we have, we have 33 women from the Scottish universities and then a smattering from Wales and Ireland. So again, you see that uh, Oxford and Cambridge still predominate. And... Uh, Again, we have a testimony of this as well. Gordon Welshman, who was uh, uh, worked on the bombs, amongst other things, and became director of technical equipment, wrote in April 1943. He wanted 18 staff for Hut 6, which we see here. Um, uh, he wrote, uh, with regard to male recruits, this is, the only hope of getting the numbers we need is to pick the cream of the undergraduates from Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, so nothing new there. He also went on to consider female recruits and he said the problem of getting women from the universities is somewhat similar the best chance of obtaining the right type of ability is to take and i quote undergraduates with a double te at the end um, from oxford and cambridge so even as late as 1943 they're not um, casting their net necessarily any wider uh, there's also a deeper character um, uh, if you probe these numbers more deeply the people who have degrees from universities other than Oxford and Cambridge don't work in jobs that are as senior as those that do so there is a bias in favor of Morse if you look at the 82 temporary senior assistant officers as opposed to the temporary junior assistant officers 89% uh, of the senior officers uh, went to Oxford and Cambridge whereas only 73% of the junior officers went to Oxford and Cambridge. So if you were an Oxbridge man, probably, you would do well. And there are a number of service personnel whose degrees we can identify. Uh, there are four lieutenant colonels we know worked at Bletchley Park, who, um, uh, three wing commanders, uh, five out of six majors, nine out of 16 captains, all went to Oxford or Cambridge. So even within the military services who are seconded to Bletchley, there is a bias in favour of um, these people. Um, but looking at the, the junior staff, we get a completely different picture. Uh, a huge proportion of the personnel were these uh, lower ranked um, production line staff, if you like. And again, these mostly do not have a university education. Uh, you can look at the raw numbers. Um, on the Roll of Honour, and there, 395 are known to have gone to university, whereas nearly 11,000 almost certainly didn't. So graduates are in the, are a tiny minority, at 3.6% of the, of the more junior workforce. Actually, this isn't, this represents the demographic of the country, between two and 3% of people had degrees at the time. So it's, uh, they basically recruited the population, and most of the population doesn't have a degree. Uh, there were the few graduates that there were tended to work in the uh, more intellectual, if you like, um, analytical and intelligence branches of the organisation, whereas uh, most of the ones without degrees, including these ladies, these are Wren bomb operators down at Eastcote. The big there was a hundred bomb machines in Eastcote run by a thousand odd Wrens. Um, of the three thousand Wrens we know ran bomb machines. I've only identified five who had a university degree. So the majority of that junior workforce don't. 
How do they get there? Well, initially, GCNCS recruits uh, women from uh, the local area. Bletchley, um, Bletchley Labour Exchange is used to acquire uh, relatively low qualified female staff. And, uh, but then after 1942, you get, or oh, December 1941, you get the National Service Act number two, which introduces conscription for women. So there becomes a large pool of service women who are available for, for this kind of work. Uh, they're also offered, they can join the land army or they can work in a factory. But um, a lot of them join the services and actually the vast majority of the women who joined the military services volunteered to do so. The conscription didn't actually add to their numbers particularly significantly. And of those, the vast majority joined the, uh, the ATS, the Auxiliary Territorial Service, which is the army essentially. Uh, there were 222,000 ATS, uh, but it was considered the least glamorous of the three services and uh, was least popular among those who had a choice, but it was the largest. Uh, it was also, there was a snobbery about it, it was considered to be the most sort of working class, if you like, of the, of the three services. Um, and uh, those in the other services would cast aspersions on its morals. Um, uh, our late Queen was in the ATS, on the other hand, so can't have been that bad. Uh, the Wrens, the Women's Royal Naval Service, very much considered themselves an elite. They were the smallest service with only 80,000 personnel. Um, but the one that was what the Wrens thought of themselves, the one that was generally the most popular and fashionable was uh, the WAF. Uh, the Air Force and all things connected with flight were considered to be the, you know, the glamorous end of the industry, you know, the, the F1 of the day. And so, um, although it was slightly larger than the Wrens, it had this, this aura of glamour around. There was about 185,000 women in the, in the WAF. And Bletchley, once these people, once these women were in the military services, Bletchley Park was able to sweep up uh, the personnel. I was going to say it needed. Some of the personnel it needed had to fight tooth and nail for every person it got. But um, it got a lot of them. And by the end of the war, Bletchley has 75.6% of its workforce is female. So out of the 9,000 people, about 6,000 are women. But the vast bulk of those women are in these junior processing factory production line roles. Um, of those, the largest population is, is Wrens. There were over 2,500 Wrens employed. That's partly because the bomb machines are run by the Wrens and there are, a huge number, there are over 200 bombs, so you need a huge number of Wrens. Uh, WAFs come second with around 1,000 and only about 400 uh, ATS. Uh, most of these women were only expected to have passed their school certificate. They weren't expected to have any kind of um, higher education. And the selection criteria for them was pretty much there was no selection. Uh, what happened, um, I looked at the Wrens in particular, but uh, it tended to be that the Wrens would be sent to training. Uh, and they initially this happened in Greenwich. Latterly, it was evacuated and it was carried on at uh, Tullahue and Castle here up near Glasgow. So it would be an intimidating place. Basically, Wren training involved naval history, polishing staircases and drill. And as far as I can tell, the GCNCS criteria for recruitment was if you could survive naval history, polishing staircases and drill um, without and still polishing the corners at the end of the day and you didn't cry too much, then you were considered the right sort and you found your way to Bletchley Park. However, uh, there's a quite striking feature in February 1942 uh, GCNCS decided that it would be a good idea to send GCNCS recruiters to the Wren training bases to actually uh, interview the women before they got recruited for Bletchley Park. You'd think, you know, that would be a no-brainer, but apparently not. And uh, it was, it's, it's written in the archive that this, this eliminated a great many unsuitable ratings and was most satisfactory from every point of view. Well, duh. But um, you know, but previously to that, they were literally just picking names off a list, right? You, 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 you look like you're diligent kind of people. Off you go to Buckinghamshire. Um, we have a, a, a candidate who went through this process. This is Nora Knight, um, who was interviewed for our oral history programme. 
uh, what, what we've been able to do for the last 10 years or so, every time we identify a, a living veteran, we ask if we can interview them and we have a collection of these interviews which are accessible now through our, the transcripts are accessible accessible through our website so if you go onto our roll of honor and you look people up you will see with transcript or without transcripts and we've in, managed to interview around 500 people now uh, sadly only a minority of them are still with us but we managed to and the, the number of interviews we're doing is really trailing off now we're from doing a lot we're doing only one or two you know now but there are still people out there who are interviewing um, but anyway Nora was a Wren she was recruited as a bomb operator and she describes her experience of of the recruitment process and she says I don't know how I ever got picked for Stanmore which is where the bombs were certainly I was never asked my selection questions any selection questions such as did I do crosswords or puzzles etc or speak languages etc it seems that the capacity of our brain was sublimely irrelevant to what we were about to do however I was certainly taller than most for my age and I often mused later that it, I was picked purely because of my height, as it required tall girls to reach the highest set of drums on the bomb machines. But I'm getting ahead of myself. What I did notice was that whilst we were all pretty sociable and a mixed bunch, and we all got along very well, there was amongst us a major predominance of boarding school girls. And I have since thought that this marked us out as, quote, nice girls who would do as we were told and never discuss our work outside. Other than that, I have no idea how I came to be selected, and I'm sure most of the others didn't know either. So, basically, there is this, and this takes us back to Miss Moore and her tours of Scotland, there is a, while for men, the criterion is, did you go to Oxbridge? The criterion for women is this nebulous 1940s concept of, are you a nice girl? Are you uh, middle class? relatively educated reliable re can be relied upon to be discreet and you know if your father's a member of the golf club jolly good um this is a, a leaving party from 1945 for the americans who worked in hut three so there's a few americans scattered in there but this is one of the few sort of group photographs that we have of bletchley park personnel um i'm not uh I've used the, the sort of term middle class a great deal during this talk. I'm not arguing that there were no middle working class people within Bletchley Park. There were because particularly the women who were recruited through Bletchley Labour Exchange in the early part of the war, many of them were from more modest backgrounds. But where Bletchley Park has, a, has more of a say, both pre-war and with the women's services during the war, their focus is very much on uh, middle class uh, middle and upper class personnel and uh, this is partly because they're looking for people who are a little bit more educated even having a good pass a secondary the school certificate was not um, general throughout the whole population but um, and then the school certificate covers the sort of the, the junior members of the organization the moment you creep up to any levels of management or cryptanalytical responsibility or seniority of any kind really you walk, you, you immediately walk into a world which is full of uh, white middle class male Oxbridge graduates and uh, there you are and this is uh, this cuts against a lot of the the popular perception of Bletchley Park which people because of um, stories around uh, Turing's sexuality and his neurodiversity and some of the other uh, the, the characters of some of the other famous individuals and the fact that a few women were able to, for example, um, Margaret Rocco showed you earlier, Mavis Beatty, Joan Clark, managed to break the, the many glass ceilings above them. There is this perception that Bletchley was a, was a, was a liberal, forward-looking, um, nice place to work that wasn't somehow an exception to the brutal world of the 1940s. Um, sorry, folks, it wasn't. Basically, Bletchley Park was part of the Secret Intelligence Service. It was part of the Foreign Office, and it happened in the 1940s. And it represent, its staffing and its recruitment represents all of the things that were, in, to modern eyes, wrong with the Foreign Office and the 1940s. So, uh, although strikingly individual individuals are present and they make it through the system in some cases they are not chosen on that basis and they are not uh, and the system doesn't necessarily encourage them 
Uh, I get a, a lot of correspondence from people who are particularly interested in the women of Bletchley Park uh, for good reasons and that, you know, they formed the majority of the workforce. But the way I like to respond to that interest is to say that the, the celebrities, if you like, the, the famous women of Bletchley Park, Mavis Beatty, Joan Clark, Margaret Rock, whoever, did not do well and succeed and become the heroes of World War II that they are because Bletchley Park was a benign place for women to work. They succeeded in spite of the fact that it was the opposite. Which I think for, uh, we, did, we work with women in STEM, women and girls in STEM and things like that, I think is an equally inspiring message in its own way, even though it may not be the, the normal mythology. Thank you. David, thank you ever so much. What I found particularly thrilling was the kind of a closeness of the presentation to the, the raw data and, and a sense <laughs> of, of research being done and having been done. And, and it's sort of it's about going through the meat grinder and, and, and coming out the other end in, in, in such a processed way. And, and a real sense of sort of ongoing um, um, research. And like I say, I really appreciate that kind of sense of a almost like fresh from the archives, um, as well as fresh from your own sort of cogitations about about this material. We have time for questions, David, if you if you wouldn't mind. Oh, you could, I was going to pour you some water, but I, I didn't, didn't think I'd be able to open the Grosch lid. Um, so we're going to take some questions. Microphone is available for those of you who want it. Thank you ever so much. Uh, and David, if, if, if you will field the field. Yes, thank you very means. much. Put your hands up if you want to. Hello. I see if you've got a microphone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Charles Pender. I'm doing a history master here at Kellogg. Um, uh, I, if, I'm, if I may, two slightly related questions. In terms of the recruitment, um, obviously, you know, the, the, the boss was, you know, misogynist and all of that. But, um, uh, and I know that the exams were uh, languages uh, particularly based, but perhaps later on, was were mathematical skills considered to be important and um, uh, what was the balance actually even of the small number of women who were at uh, Oxbridge uh, in, in you know who were who, who studying you know mathematics rather than you know English literature or whatever so I just wonder whether perhaps um, you know the bias isn't totally down to the bias if I can put it that way there was a, a natural reason for it. and I also adduce as possible evidence of that it's quite interesting that Cambridge was uh, recruited much more than Oxford. You didn't really mention that distinction. And I think I'm right in saying that Cambridge, particularly at that stage, was perhaps even today, is particularly noted for mass, you know, the Wranglers and uh, mm -hmm. you know, sort of Trinity. Uh, I think then and now, you know, Trinity, Cambridge, sort of, uh, are getting ma young mathematicians. So I just wonder whether those factors might have been a factor in it, as well as the, you know, the, the, the obvious sort of stuff that you have found about the, the natural prejudices and predilections of that uh, time. Absolutely, you, you, have, you have cunningly nailed the exact <laughs> section of my longer research report that I, I left out on the grounds of time. Uh, one of the other legends about Bletchley is that Deniston was a classicist, a linguist, and he resisted the arrival of mathematicians at GCNCS. And uh, there's, it's definitely a fact that in World War I, when you're doing book code breaking, uh, manual paper methods, uh, additive codes, which I won't bore you with at this moment, those people were classicists. Dilly Knox was a classicist, Nigel de Grey is a classicist. That's, it, it's a linguistic skill. But the arrival of Enigma and a variety of other Hagelin, Lorentz, there's a, there's a, in 1920s and 30s, there is an eruption of mechanical encipherment and clearly to break those systems you needed people with high level mathematical skills and that is why Turing ends up at Letchley Park. Uh, one of the mathematicians who arrived, um, a Peter Twin, who came from Cambridge I think, he wrote in his memoirs that when he arrived at Bletchley, because he was a mathematician everybody thought he was very odd and he was a queer fish because he wasn't a classicist. Uh, 
I think that's a reflection of the fact that he was sent to work with Dilly Knox, who was a miserable old bugger and disliked everybody. He didn't just start disliking mathematicians. Um, so that, that quote from Peter Twin comes up over and over and over again. But what I've seen in the document, the, so that same correspondence I've been going through is as early as 32, Denniston is going, we need mathematicians, we need engineers, we need people with this skill set. Um, and please can people start recommending people for the exams who are mathematicians and the like. And so uh, Trinity, as you say, is provides, uh, built up famously is from Trinity, one of the most significant mathematicians uh, at Bletchley Park. Uh, Turing is from King's, Gordon Welshman is from King's. Uh, those mathematicians are definitely being recruited in the 1930s and the emergency list again is a balance of class the classicists and archaeologists you'd expect to see but also a lot of mathematicians so the the old myth that Denniston didn't recognize that has been my research proved that not to be the case he is he is following the trends in the industry and he is calling in more and more mathematicians as you go along so um, they are um, Yes, they are mathematicians. I would argue yes, but they are still from Oxford and Cambridge and they are still mostly men. Um, and the interesting thing, which I would, I wish that I could find a, a way of attacking it, I haven't quite figured out how to do the research yet, is this question of the Indian mathematicians, because I think that's a, a, an interesting question. That might have been a, a, a possibly, I mean, the 1930s. I mean, half of them were being followed by MI5, yeah, so that would have... They were worried about loyalty and... Exactly, pressure, exactly. It was way well have been, but I, I, I can, I've not found any concrete evidence of that fact yet. It would be nice if I could find a document that said that explicitly. Uh, in terms of the women, uh, Margaret Rock in particular, she did maths at Bedford College. She then went on to be a statistician for the Board of Trade for most of the 1920s. So she is definitely recruited on the basis of her maths. Um, so there are, there are mathematical women on that side as well. But again, you have... Um, the, the, the biases of the age against women firstly getting to university and even worse getting to university as mathematicians but um, uh, yeah <laughs> I'll stop talking has that answered the question uh, yeah I, thank, you. thank you thank you very much for that that was so interesting I, I'd love to know a little bit more about the Americans that were there and how they fit into this sort of quintessentially British class-based system. Who were they and what do we know about them? Well, there's, there's a whole other talk in the Americans, but the, the striking thing about the relationship with the US is that pre-war, the US is an intelligence target for the UK. You have the, the, the naval treaties in the 20s and 30s, and we are actively seeking to break American codes so we can understand their diplomatic position in those negotiations. And so there is no tradition of cooperation with the Americans and part of that is because the Americans don't have a signals intelligence agency in the 1920s because Henry Stinson gentlemen don't read each other's mail but very early in the war Churchill is keen on collaboration with the Americans on all fronts and you get the um, correct me if I'm wrong it's the Tizard Commission isn't it they go over to America to talk about bomb sites and talk about radar and talk about all these other technologies and there's a point in that conversation in late 1940 where uh, General Strong, who's one of the US War Department representatives, goes, I think we should share on crypto. And everyone in the room kind of goes, blimey, are you sure? Because prior to that, the tradition has been one of distrust because the, the US didn't want to share stuff with the British because they thought the British would use it to spy on the US. And the British didn't want to share stuff with the Americans because they thought that it would be in the New York Times a fortnight later. Both of these facts are true, by the way, but um, they managed to kind of get over it. And the first four Americans come to the UK in February 1941 to Bletchley Park. And they are specifically there. There's two from the War Department and two from the Navy. Because the Navy and the War Department in the US on signals don't talk to each other. They literally, uh, the War Department breaks Japanese codes on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. And the Army breaks Japanese codes on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays. Because they couldn't decide who was responsible for it. So there's a real tension in the US. Those four guys come, they're showing everything, they go back to America, and then in 43 you get a tranche of about 200 Americans who are brought over, and their role is to be embedded in all the teams dealing with Enigma specifically, 
um, and a few other little bits and pieces. And they they are placed in roles as if they were British people. They just filter into the whole system. And they're, they're sort of what each team will have an American in it who is treated as if he's British, basically. And it's that integration which is one of the really fundamental parts of the success of the organisation. And then the intelligence is distributed um, without favour to Allied commanders, whether they're British, French, Canadian, Polish. Not so much the Free French, they're suspicious of the Free French. So these Americans are integrated into the system. Uh, I think it was a bit of a culture clash for both sides, um, but it seems to have worked. And the, the proof of that is that when they signed the Yukusa Agreement in 1946, the natural thing in 1945 would have been for the two countries to go their own way. And actually at that point, although the Navy and the War Department still had signals intelligence agencies, NSA wasn't created until the early 50s. So they didn't really have a GCHQ equivalent in the US. But it was decided at the professional level rather than the, 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 the political level that the relationship should continue. And US embeds continued to come to the UK and vice versa, and the relationship continued. And part of my role at Bletchley now is every year I get the tranche of NSA personnel who are on the way to Cheltenham to do their three-year tour in Cheltenham. And they come to Bletchley and I take them into Denniston's office where I can say this is where the first four Americans who came over stood in 1941. And they, they get it because they are part of that continuous chain. Um, so Americans are absorbed into the system. Um, interestingly, the, the, in terms of the Americans' background, they're, the one group that are, have been studied quite extensively are the liaison officers who are sent to American commands in, in the theatres of war, so-called special liaison officers. And these guys would be headquartered with the senior American commanders to provide them so that the, the, the intelligence from Bletchley could be wireless to those people and they would then manage its, its security and distribution to the senior commanders. Those men uh, have been a very heavily studied group because out of the sort of 25 of them, something like nine ended up on the Supreme Court, other ones ended up being vice presidents. They, they are all Ivy League and they are all very, very highly skilled and post-war highly successful people. So it's clear that on the other side of the Atlantic, the Americans are pulling in their sort of Oxbridge equivalents into their intelligence and signals community. And the OSS famously is full of, you know, preppy Ivy League types. So um, the same uh, academic streaming slash bias, whatever you want to call it, into intelligence from the senior universities is happening on the other side of the Atlantic just as much as it is on this side. I, I think, I, I don't, I'm winging it slightly there because I haven't looked into it in detail. But. Anyone else? Oh, sorry, you slightly before you, so I'll come to you after. Thank you. Um, my daughter's studying um, marketing and technology, and she's studying the Chinese Communist Party. Um, so I Um, there, I wouldn't say there's a pattern. It is striking that um, these people, um, many of the the ones who are in that elite university recruitment band, are people who would have succeeded anyway and go on to succeed anyway, and their war service is, in many ways, incidental to their subsequent careers. Um, I'm thinking about. Um, some of some of those people who went on, uh, Walter Wright and Walter Ettinghausen, who went to went on to be foreign minister of Israel. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the others now off the top of my head. But there's a number of a lot of them go back into academia or go into academia after the war because they they that was their plan all along when they were undergraduates. So people like uh, Harry Hinsley, Bill Tut, uh, Turing, of course, uh, Max Newman is an academic before and after the war. So there's the, none of, of the Oxford and Cambridge people, it's striking how many of them never sever their tie with the universities. And a huge number of them end up back in academia 
after the war. Uh, there are others who go into politics and things like that. But um, oh, and of course the, the the we don't. I'm just trying to think. Yeah, that's is, is that enough? Sorry, I'm <laughs> getting on the tangent there. But yes, it's it seems to me that. Um, and I think it's one of the things that people forget. You, you meet these 98-year-old ladies and they go, oh, you, so you were at Bletchley Park? And they go, yeah, I was at Bletchley Park for a year and a half when I was 19. I'm now 90. I've done a few other things in my life. <laughs> and there's a lovely veteran um, who I know quite well who um, she went on to be the uh, producer of University Challenge for Granada and Natalie, the BBC. And for those of you that are old enough to remember it, her claim to fame is she invented the quiz show Ask the Family. Mm. which if you were a child in the 1970s as I was you might remember it um, so yes a lot of these people went on to do very interesting things and it is it is well not unfortunate but I always think it's ironic that we remember them for something they would they did they did they didn't even do out of choice when they were 19 year olds you know some of the some of the senior male figures you know they went into it no what they with their eyes open so there's a gentleman yeah, can, we, can, we just take Sorry, more, can we just take one more question yeah. please and, and then we're going to break the drinks we can take any other questions into conversation afterwards if David's amenable. But yeah. one more question. Just, just, okay. just, you were just going to come back yes. quickly. I was just interested when you talked about the experience of this event, and I just wondered if you back to my friend Azam and say working with Fletcher had been a catalyst for the Uh it's, it's, it's hard to generalise, I think. Yeah. Uh, some people put it behind them and won't move to. The, the problem they all have is none of them can say what they did. So when you go for a job after the war, you have a letter saying, you were quite useful in the Foreign Office, thank you very much. And that's all it says. And so um, you can't use Bletchley Park as a stepping stone to do anything. And, and uh, 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 Margaret Rock, of course, and Mavis Beatty stayed at GCHQ until the 1970s. So they, you know, there was a career in the, in the institution post-war, which a number of the more successful people took. Um, what's his name? John Tiltman went on to be director of GCHQ and then to work for the NSA right up until more or less he died. So there's lots of archaeologists on the list as well, but we can talk about them later. Um, so there's the last question down here. Yes. Uh, hello. Um, very interesting talk, so thank you for that. Um, two um, uh, quite related questions, I hope. Um, firstly, does history relate the men Oxbridge graduates, you know, from a social, economic, um, educational background, were they typically, or the vast majority, um, do you have any um, information on their high school education? Was it all English boys boarding schools? And then did um, the women who typically weren't graduates, uh, but came from girls, English, boarding schools, was there um, any social mobility? There must have been a hell of a lot of bright women there who just due to the uh, social dynamics of the, of the 30s weren't going off to university but probably were just as bright as some of their seniors. So was there any um, sort of promotion within them? And finally, do we know how many of these men and women went on possibly to get married after the war? We don't have any fledgling babies, though. Oh, <laughs> uh, we do, yes. Um, the, uh, the, to answer the first part of the question, um, to get into university at all in the 1930s, the majority of people would have been privately educated. Grammar there were grammar schools, and, the, and, and Bill Tutt is a case in point. Bill Tutt was a, his parent, his, grand, his father was a gardener uh, in Newmarket. He got a scholarship to the local grammar school. On the basis of the grammar school, he got a scholarship to um, Trinity College. And then from Trinity College, he went to Bletchley Park. And then he went back to Cambridge and ultimately to uh, Wellington University in Ontario. So he's, he's, a, he's a case of somebody who, who worked his way up from a working class background to Oxbridge and then from there into Bletchley. So Bletchley Park isn't, or the GCNCS isn't particularly concerned about people's pre-university background uh, if they're from the Oxford and Cambridge recruitment. So, so there are, you do see people who have won their way up by scholarships and they, they don't seem to be, there doesn't seem to be any bias against them. Once, once they're in Oxbridge, they're in the system enough that it's fine. 
Um, on the women's side, what's interesting is, and that, that talk of you know, lots of boarding school girls, uh, there is a bias towards uh, middle class and upper middle class women because uh, I know, and for, for, sort of anecdotally, I haven't looked at this in depth, but anecdotally, I know a lot of a lot of veterans who um, finishing school was a big thing in the 1930s, and many women who were of means wouldn't go to university, but they'd go to Switzerland, you know, and they come back from Switzerland, they can speak French and German, they have an experience of the European continent, they've got a bit of sort of independence and sophistication about them, and they, and this, this, um, Women, a, a girl, 30 girls who are competent, fluent in two languages at three pounds a week, those girls are all finishing school graduates because that's where they've picked up the two languages. And we have other veterans who uh, there was a, a lot of, there was a high level of German immigration into the UK in the 20s and 30s. And so there were a lot of Germans in domestic service in the UK. So there are a number of veterans I know who learnt German from their cook or their nanny or whatever. So um, there is a there's, a there's there's a there's a class bias in why women speak French or German, which which makes its way into the GCNCS structure because if you're looking for women with those language skills, how do they acquire those language skills? And that's that's how they get there. So you know while they might not have gone to Cambridge, they might have gone to you know Lausanne for two years in there late teens and come back with all sorts of useful skills. Does that answer your question? Or? Well, the question was, was there social mobility? Because the vast majority of the women were not at the, you know, the senior sort of office. Uh, within Ble within GCNCS, yeah. no. Yes. Absolutely it's not. a short answer. Yeah. There are a few that make it up the chain, but there is no expectation that those women who are recruited to do the, the production line jobs will ever do anything other than what they're doing. Right. And that's just, you know, I mean, in, in fact, there is a problem with the WAFs because a lot of WAFs are recruited and then after a year, um, their friends who they trained with, a significant proportion of those women have become eligible for promotion courses, either to NCO rank or even to officer rank within the WAF. And the ones at Bletchley have had no career progression at all. They've just been sitting there doing the same job. And so they complain to their bosses and go, why, why can't we get promoted? And the, the, the RAF, the, or GCNCS goes to the RAF and says, we want to promote some of our girls uh, because it will keep them happy and you know, keep morale up and everything else. And there's a discussion about it and then the RAF go, yeah, all right, you can promote a few if you want. And, and Bletchley Park goes, great, fantastic. And then the RAF goes, yes, send them to us and we'll put them on an officer training course for three months. At which point Bletchley Park goes, we don't want to give them two for three months, they're working. Can you just promote them anyway? And there's a sort of back and forth correspondence about this, about that, that the, 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 the structure, there is so much career inertia within GCNCS that there is nowhere to go. And actually, at the same time, the workforce doesn't grow to its enormous extent. 75.6% women is late 1943, 1944, 1945. So many of those women are only in the organisation for a year, year and a half. Um, so their chance to push through, as I say, the many glass ceilings is, is quite limited. David, thank you ever so much indeed. Thanks for taking our questions. I'm sure that you might be able to answer a few more um, now. However, if you don't mind, ladies and gentlemen, there's some drinks served at the back. Um, so please join us for a glass of, of wine or something else. Thank you ever so much for turning out and uh, attending. And particularly, David, thank you ever so much for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.